morning and welcome to the second session of House Matters. I'm Margaret Rathen, um, chair of the Council for It's great to see you all here. I want to um, introduce to you, we have two speakers today. We're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jam Gadar, who is um, director of the Stanford Concussion and Brain Performance Center, titles, as well as Scott Anderson, uh, Director of Athletic Training. They will both be speaking on some very important information about concussions and traumatic brain injury with us, um, from early detect detection to treatment and to prevention. I also want to mention that Dr. Jar will be at the pavilion afterwards and pick up some of the devices we'll be talking about. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Okay, well, we're going to, Scott and I are going to go back and forth. We're going to, this is the first time we've done this act, so if you've uh, got any suggestions afterwards or feedback, we're happy to, to hear them. Um, usually, you know, you just give a talk and get questions, but I think it would make it much more interactive because actually that's what we do. We're very interactive with the Stanford athletes. Um, it's, uh, Scott has, has enormous background in uh, athletes' health. And I have background in, in neurosurgery, neurology, um, traumatic brain injury. And so, you know, it's one thing seeing somebody in a trauma center and they come in coma after a car accident. It's another thing having an athlete coming off the field with a head injury and trying to diagnose a concussion. So, um, so I think that it's really good. You know, we're we're going to be talking back and forth, but you'll see, or sort of see an interaction going back and forth as well. Um, so um, let's just... Go on. So the first thing we have to do is go through, at Stanford, everyone's got a conflict. I know. I came here two years ago from New York, from Cornell, and, and uh, I, had, I had conflicts then, but uh, it turns out at Stanford, uh, everyone's got conflicts. They've got something going on. So I've got this, this um, I'm funded by uh, Department of Defense. A lot of the eye tracking stuff you see, the military's put $30 million into this technology, and it's their lead technology for figuring out if somebody had a, had a concussion. And um, um, I'm also on the board of directors of SyncThink, which is a company that makes an eye tracker that we use here at Stanford. And this is, <clears throat> this is actually in one of the, the pavilions over, over there. So if you want to go and uh, get your score, you can go over there. And people tend to become very competitive. They, they said, what is my score? What's your score? And <laughs> uh, you know, so you can use it for that if you like. Um, so let's start off with, and this is where I'm going to engage Scott. Um, the fog of concussion. Let's do a little poll first. Um, uh, how many people think that concussion is diagnosable, that there's actually things you can diagnose, that physicians have a set of things? Okay, one, one, two. Most of the people, right? Most people think that there's a, there's a set of diagnostic criteria, and if you meet those criteria, you have a concussion. Okay, so, Scott, what do you think? Uh, I would disagree. <laughs> Okay. I mean, here's a here's a so so why would you why would you disagree? So somebody's uh, some so a football player is you know uh, gets hit and comes to sidelines. You should be able to diagnose it based upon known diagnostic criteria, right? True, uh, but we can't. <laughs> uh, I think it's it's a multifactorial equation, and I think that there's uh, one is that we don't and Jam's going to talk about this is that we don't actually know what a concussion is. Um, and this is where the public has been misled. And part of our job today is hopefully to kind of unpack concussion and talk a little bit about uh, why this is the case. Um, I think uh, when, it, when it comes to concussion, there are a lot of variables to consider. And the, the situation that we're in currently with concussion is because of our lack of understanding, we're relying on subjective information or uh, report from the athlete, in this case, on the sidelines to tell us um, what they've experienced. Um, you know, it's a, a different scenario if you've got a musculoskeletal injury, you can see your doctor and have a test and it tells us what the problem is. But on the sidelines, if someone comes and says that they've got a problem, this subset of symptoms can also be related to other diagnoses. And this is where the confusion lies. So um, turn it back over to you. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the old days, it used to be uh, concussion was uh, a loss of consciousness. So that's pretty easy, right? So somebody gets hit and they drop and they're lying there and they're not moving. You come over and they're out, you know? 
That's pretty easy. That's, you can make that a diagnostic criteria. But then they found out a lot of people get hit and don't pass out, don't have loss of consciousness and have some kind of problem and they decided to call that concussion. And then they said, well, what's the first, what's things that we can readily look at that, that people have after a hit to the head? And they looked at symptoms. So if you look at the top symptoms after a hit to the head, it's headache, dizziness, and vision problems. And uh, so the top two reasons for seeing a neurologist, just generally for the, for the public, is headache and dizziness. So not all those people have a head injury. You can see it's very nonspecific. And they have a whole list of things. So there's something, and this is where I get to Scott, is we, when we talk about spotter technology now. So, you know, in terms of, so how do you pick out these people? And we're supposed to know that they're somehow uh, strange or weird. They're not acting right. They're, their brains aren't working. So we have all these, so if you start really taking a deep dive in here, you realize why there's 40 different definitions for concussion and, and the physicians make up the diagnosis. And if you take one person to one physician, they'll say it's a concussion. The other one will say well, it's not a concussion and so on. There's a lot of variability in this. And, and, the, and the issue really comes down to is going by symptoms or any sort of strange change. So let's, one thing that really highlights this is um, a technology that now is required in all NFL games and actually Pac-12 is spotter technology because the person on the sidelines may not see something, you know, that you could see from above. And so the question comes, well, that person must know then how to screen for concussions, know how to pick out people, right? So over to Scott, who's actually, uh, well, you, you say, who I don't know if I can tell. Who, who <laughs> yeah, so is. I actually act as a spotter. So uh, here at Stanford, I work with the football team and I'm on the field. So typically what happens is someone goes down on the field, the people that run out, that's me and my staff, and we're the ones that kind of manage the, uh, the injury and assess the, the problem and work closely with the doctors to arrive at a diagnosis and determine whether or not it's safe for the person to return to play. Uh, I also have another role separate to this, which is with the NFL as a spotter for the 49ers. And so my job really is to um, sit up in a booth uh, and uh, have communication to both sidelines and to both sidelines medical staffs. And my job really is to see what they can't see from the field. Um, there's a lot of things going on on the sidelines. It's easy to get distracted. Um, sometimes the medical staff has their back turned to the field because they're dealing with um, other injuries. Of, a, of players and they can't see what's happening. And so my job really is to communicate and coordinate uh, getting players off the field uh, during NFL games. And this year, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but they put in a uh, medical timeout, which is allows me to stop the game. Um, if we think that someone has uh, been injured severely or has uh, exhibited signs of disorientation related to head injuries, um, we can actually do that now. So um, that's a, uh, there's quite a bit of, um, I think, uh, evolution happening in this space um, and in attempts to really try to understand what we're dealing with and um, to better uh, tackle it. So. Yeah, I mean, but, but the thing is, so what, what, so when you're a spotter, they tell you, okay, uh, I mean, they must t teach you like how to identify a possible concussion. What are the kind of things they do they sure. mean? Yeah, so they, they tell us, you know, essentially that you have to have you have to observe obvious signs of a disorientation. So you have to see the athlete um, stumble or uh, appear as if they are um, injured in some way. Typically, we see this with um, grasping the face mask. A lot of the times, the football players will grasp the face mask where they'll shake their head or they'll put their hands on their head. Um, they'll be stumbling around. Um, and we typically corroborate this with the video analysis. So we look at the video replay in real time and are able to play the you know, the play over and over again to see this, because sometimes it's very hard to see during real time in the game. And then um, we have essentially until the next play starts to make a decision about whether or not um, there's been, we've seen, the, met this criteria to, to warrant uh, stopping the play and, and uh, moving them off the field. So notice that keyword orientation. We're going to come back to that. Um, so it, <clears throat> it's something that we all do all the time. It's called paying attention, but you've got to orient to the outside world to process information. And it turns out that um, sports neuroscience, I like to call it sports neuroscience, is a whole new field that's, that's about, I don't know if you know neuro, the word neuro has been attached to lots of things like, you know, neuro law, neuro marketing, um, you know, neuro now is the, the key word. Uh, so um, in, terms of, in terms of what you do on a daily basis or what you're doing right here in this lecture right now, you're expecting me to talk at that point and the words didn't come. And so you got an error signal. So you're always, your brain is always in a predictive state. I'm going to get into this. This is the main part of this talk is the science behind this is that 
you're actually, your brain is half a second behind. It takes about half a second to realize what's going on. So you're playing tennis, that you see the ball, it's actually over there. So you have to swing a racket before you get there. Well, you're swinging your, bra your brain all the time before the information comes in, so you can catch it just in time and be in real time and interact with the outside world. If you, if you wait for things to happen, you'll never be able to interact. And so you learn over many, many years how to predict, and your brain is in that state when you're doing it. It turns out, and I'm sort of summarizing the science a little quickly, but it turns out when you get a concussion, that's what gets damaged. And, and it's not, in the, in the, and we should ask ourselves, what is not damaged after a hit to the head, usually in a concussion? People aren't paralyzed. They don't have sensory problems. I mean, they can see, we'll, we'll get into the vision part, what part they don't see. Uh, their hearing's intact. So sensory, sensory systems and motor systems intact, you know? What's happening is, though, there's something else that's going on where, and you talk to a lot of these people, that's where the fog comes in. They feel like they're in a fog. They feel in a daze, not like themselves. And you almost have to go back to basic neuroscience and figure this thing out from the beginning. It actually, concussion makes us all go back and fundamentally challenge but how the brain really is thinking. And, and I, we're going to get into that. Okay, so uh, 17 kids die a year playing football. And uh, this, this plus CTE are the big drivers in the public right now. This is where is my eight-year-old playing football going to get demented when he or she, these soccer players, you know, and hockey players and, and, and lacrosse players. And so a lot of people are going from football to lacrosse trying to avoid this, but it turns out head injuries are just as common. And so actually, if you look at NCAA data, the most common first concussions are in wrestling. And we, we see a lot of wrestlers here. I, mean, I see a lot of wrestlers, so does Scott, uh, who have concussions. So wrestling, ice hockey, football, um, Soccer, basketball, uh, swimmers, yes, swimmers, uh, sailors, everybody, just you in the audience getting head injury, very common, extremely common. So these 17 kids die, and there's about, and the, the, the thinking is, well, they had a concussion, they put them back in and got another hit and died. So if you look at the number of concussions occurring, millions a year, and the number of people that get sent back in, only 17 die, there's kind of, it's very difficult to make an association. So, and a lot of these kids are dying because of car, heart problems or brain aneurysms or other things. Some of them die of a massive head injury because the way they, get, they got hit and their genetics. Uh, but this drives the anxiety in the public and CTE to really be anxious about concussion. Um, the people that have had a concussion are three times more likely because their attention is not working. And so they, not, besides head injuries, they get a lot of other injuries. And we'll, we'll, t we'll talk about attention that gets disrupted not only from a hit to the head, but also from sleep deprivation. So a lot of kids are getting injured because they're, especially around here, because uh, they're sleep deprived. And so we're all shifting, and Scott and I are shifting towards brain performance, optimal brain performance. How can we, you know, I think everyone's sort of focused on concussions is really about brain performance. You want people to be focused and paying attention when they do a contact sport. So attention is the most common impairment after a force to the head. And so I just bring this in, you know, I think the helmet is good for skull fractures and for scalp injuries do not prevent concussions. Why? Because concussions are caused by the neck. The neck whips the brain around. And until people come up with protective gear for the neck, they're not going to solve this problem. So NASCARs figured this out. It's called the hands device. Basically, fix your head to your torso so you're, you can't turn your head. <laughs> and those guys hit a wall 200 miles an hour and just walk away. It's the movement of the head on the neck that's producing this whiplash. And the injuries are all in the front part of the brain. When I operate on people in coma from severe TBI, all the blood clots are in the front. They're not, I never operate on somebody in the back of the head because it's around the fulcrum of the neck. Remember your physics? Where this thing in the front turns the most and has the most shearing injury. It's all in the front. So that's just a yeah, question for you. Huh? Question for you. Oh, okay. So you talked about uh, uh, helmets protecting from skull injury. What types of equipment do we have out there that, uh, that are um, common in sport uh, can be used to prevent a concussion? Uh, right now, so, a huh? mouth guard, or you know, there's no, lots I of mean, different types of equipment. It, 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 as long as you, so a lot of people are doing now is neck neck strengthening exercises to try to get their necks really big fat, and that'll work as long as like if you go hit a ball and in soccer and your your neck is trained to tense up before you hit the ball, that's fine. 
But if the ball hits you and you're not expecting it, it doesn't matter how much muscle you got, your head's going to whip around. And so at the end of the day, uh, the, the solution for concussion is to come up with um, a neck restraint device. So the Army is developing some materials that go between the, uh, the helmet and the torso. And these, these things are very sensitive. And as soon as you start moving too fast, they check you. So it's like a hands device, but it allows your head to move back and forth. So it's going to be a solution like that. And that'll cure the concussion and football and everything. It'll solve a lot of problems out there. Um, I think the helmet, you, the helmet will turn into, and for bike helmets too at that point, will turn into a polyethylene shell, which is, you'll need to protect for skull fractures and be very lightweight. And you'll have something between there and your, and your torso. And you'll, as soon as it detects a fast movement, it'll check you and you won't have that shearing motion. So, but you know how many, there's only one lab doing research on that. Everyone, and you talk to the, yes. I don't know. They're, I'm not a football um, expert, but I don't know what I it was called what it, during the game. But uh, I don't. I don't think it was because he's hitting the front of his body, and it's not from the side like a typical ear hole. The, the thing. What I want to see is he's hitting his chest. Yeah. He's not. Hitting, this per, this person had a concussion, but it's the hit the chest and and the and the, and the neck whips the brain around. So you don't have to get a direct hit hit to the head. Well, people in car accidents all day. They don't get a direct hit to their head. The seatbelt holds back their torso and their head whips around and yep. they, they come away with a concussion. This is an important point to mention too as well because a lot of people think that concussion is derived from head to head impact or head to ball impact or head to uh, apparatus impact. And I think um, one of the things we clearly don't understand about concussion is what, if, what is considered an impact? And that's a whole other conversation for another day. But if, I hit, if two heads are hitting together, um, is that considered an impact? Probably. But if I hit you in your chest and your head snaps back, is that also considered an impact? As of right now, not today. It hasn't been classified as so. But the same type of injury can result. And this is where a lot of the confusion is in this space as well, looking at biomechanics of injury. Um, there's obviously implications for and risk for brain injury in these circumstances as well that we just clearly don't understand. And so if you, we've also done a lot of work in the area of uh, accelerometry, looking at mouth guards with, uh, you know, sensors and things like that to try to see if we can classify these hits. And if there's a threshold to, um, you know, exposure to a brain injury based on the number of hits they've taken or the, or the severity of the type of impacts. Yeah, so David Camarillo, who's in bioengineering here, has been working with mouth guards, accelerometers in them. And we need that technology. I mean, the spotter technology is okay, but at the end of the day, you need to know the force that the, the, the head's getting during a game and select those people out for screening. So we do need that. Unfortunately, and David's published this, is that the accelerometers are not uh, technologically up to snuff yet. So we're, we're not there yet, but hopefully in the future it'll happen. So this is uh, the, the Brain Trauma Evidence-Based Consortium was funded by the military to Stanford with the Brain Trauma Foundation, and we do we're defining concussion and coming up with a spectrum of it, and we're working with a lot of groups, including the NCAA. And the NCAA actually adopted our, our, def, our general definition of, uh, of, con, of, uh, of concussion, which is a change in brain function. The, the thing is, what's that brain function? That's what we all know. After force the head, and you can, you can pass out, but, but then when you wake up, you look at measures of neurological cognitive. We're not looking at symptoms. Everyone wants to get away from symptoms because they're nonspecific. They can get headaches from lots of things besides a brain injury. So uh, we need to measure things. And the key measures are, I'm going to give you a minute, are attention and balance. We went through 5,000 research articles and came down. These are the four things that seem to be prevalent after force to the head. The first three are attention, and basically disorientation, reaction time, memory, all attention functions, and then balance. And this is what we do in our clinic and what we do for evaluating athletes. It's all about evaluating attention and balance. We do the attention with the eye tracking. So this just shows the, um, the rate. If you look on day one, um, they have uh, cognitive problems. But then by day seven, 98% of people clear up. So you're looking at people after this, about 8% of people that keep going and having problems. The most common symptoms, if you look at symptoms, are headache, dizziness, and blurred vision. Those are the most common. Uh, we'll get in now. So what do we do on the sidelines to try and figure out if somebody had a, had a, uh, had a concussion? So SCAT-3 is very popular. And um, uh, we're on the third edition of that. And in there, we have orientation, we have uh, working memory, have these two attention tests. There's no reaction time. We do have balance. 
And so this is very often used. In fact, this is the SCAT3 with the eye tracking is what is used at Stanford to screen people. Um, and so this is, this is the old screening, sort of look at my finger back and forth, you know. And uh, everyone now and the neurologist realize that some measurement of eye tracking is important as a, as a function of attention. So what happens is when you're doing eye tracking, I'll get into science, you're, you're predicting where things are going to be. And we can measure that with cameras. And so this is you're visually looking at the person's eyes to see if they're jumpy. And oftentimes you won't see it. You have to, you have, to have a, uh, I'll show you some of the technology. But you have to look at the, have a camera looking at your eyes and measuring it. There's a test called the king Devic test, which is uh, often used a card that you read and you time the person on it, which is really an eye movement uh, test, but you're actually measuring how long it takes to, to, to do that. There's another test called VOMS, which is they go like this back and forth and up and down and see if you feel dizzy or nauseous or have any symptoms. This eye sync is the one where I have my conflict. It actually measures eye movement. This is one we use at, at Stanford, and I'll get into that. So I want to break right here. This is what we're doing. So now we're going to go to the sidelines. And Scott's going to tell you what he does. I think this concussion phone disappeared. <laughs> we had this. This is, well, I guess when they first had the spotter at last year, they put this red phone there that everyone was waiting to, to ring. And they, yeah. I mean, in the middle of this game, they're supposed to listen to this. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So we found out really quickly that the, uh, the, the volume on the ringer is just not sufficient enough when you're in a stadium packed full of fans and there's a game going on. But this is the procedure that we use. Essentially, the spotter will uh, call down, uh, even in our games, uh, and either provide us with video to our phones that we can look at so we can corroborate the mechanism of injury. Uh, and then we can also use uh, the iSync device to uh, test um, someone's uh, attention um, as a measurement to determine if they're uh, able to go back into the field or not. Um, the reason why this is so valuable, in my opinion, is because it's really the first known objective test that we can use in real time and in a short period of time to determine whether somebody can go back on the field or is at risk for another injury. When you go to uh, your doctor because you have a musculoskeletal problem, there is a, a number of differential diagnoses that this physician may have in their mind. You, if you've got a knee problem, it may be five or six different things, right? This, and you can get an MRI or an x-ray and that can tell you what the problem actually is. Um, with regards to concussion, we've never been able to do that before. And so we, someone may present to us with certain uh, symptoms that we think are related to concussion, but it can also be related to dehydration, um, to whiplash, a neck injury like uh, Jan was mentioning earlier, um, to vestibular dysfunction, so problems with balance. Um, all these things present the exact same way. And in the past, when we've had no way of objectively measuring them, we would just tell the athlete, oh yeah, you got a concussion, you're out. But we had real no way of proving that they actually had a concussion. And we had to monitor them, and we just took the conservative route. And um, now, being able to use eye tracking as a as an assessment, objective uh, uh, assessment measure, we can really determine in real time on the sidelines or you know, during the middle of a game uh, whether someone has some type of impairment that's going to lead to further injury, and that's the decision that we make to, to uh, take them off the field. Uh, for the first time since I've been at Stanford and the first time that, I've, that I know about in our history, we actually returned players to the field this year for the first time um, after testing their eye tracking and seeing that their eye tracking and their SCAT3 was normal. Um, and sent them back on the field. In the past, we would just say, well, they're complaining of a headache. We've got to hold them out. It sounds like a concussion. Uh, but now we have information that's telling us that that's not the case. And uh, it really improves our ability to um, be more sophisticated with uh, either coming up with a diagnosis or uh, not having a diagnosis. And, so and that's very controversial. So I know a lot of people in the, in the audience backs got straightened up and a little something. Now, you're putting people back in play with a headache. That's a headache representing a brain injury, and the brain's on fire. Yep. Okay, and you're putting something back, about to and that's off where, too. no, 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 there's kids, <laughs> there's kids in the audience, but that's where something really bad can happen, right? I mean, that's what people feel. I have patients coming to my clinic, and they've been told not to exercise, and that's like the worst thing you can tell somebody, especially kids, right after concussion, not to exercise. And I'll tell you why that whole thing came about. So we put everyone on a treadmill. All the Stanford athletes, people come to my clinic, they get on a treadmill right away. They have a headache. They're, I haven't seen a brain explode yet, so we're OK. Um, so this whole notion of not exercising people afterwards is from second impact syndrome. So what happened was, and it was a rat experiment, you know, basically you bang the rat on the hat, head, you wait two weeks, bang it again is like just the, like, like the first injury. But if you banged it within the week after the guy's first 
head injury, the brain would swell up. And they call it second impact. And so people said, whatever you do, somebody gets a, a head injury and has symptoms, which is probably what they, they have a concussion, a brain injury, do not put them back into play because if they get hit again, it could be really serious. Totally agree. But how did that get interpreted into no exercise? You get on a treadmill, the likelihood of getting a head injury is very, very small. So you see what happened was people took this very scary thing of if you have a concussion, don't get hit again because something bad will happen in those 17 kids who die every year. And they took that and said, don't exercise. And that was the worst thing. I mean, somebody should trace the history of that. The worst thing that ever happened because now we have all millions of kids who are told uh, to be in a dark room, not to do anything, and they get depressed, they get anxious, they get chronically fatigued, their sleep gets totally disrupted. Massive problem, more, much more bigger problem than the concussion itself. And so we do things very differently. It's very good. There's evidence now showing that early exercise actually promotes recovery. So sending this person back in with a headache has normal attention, normal balance is fine because we're looking at brain performance. People can get headaches from lots of things. 90% of the public gets headaches during the year. That doesn't mean you have a brain injury. You can get there's lots of muscles all over the head that cause headaches. Your brain doesn't have any sensation, by the way. And if you can put, you can, in neurosurgery, well, if somebody's awake, you, you poke them. Yes, there's a question. You're on the air. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting. So you know, we're picking people out because of symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. So we might be missing people who have attention and balance problems but aren't complaining. And that's really important. So I think that's where accelerometers come in. So if you have you can pick people out regardless of whether they're complaining or not and assess them. Otherwise, you need to, like, every time they come off the sideline, assess their attention and balance, right, to figure out if it is. So there are people with delayed symptoms. I think those people actually have attention and balance problems but don't. And what happens is that just about everybody who has a concussion has sleep problems. I mean, if, if somebody tells me they had a concussion, but for the moment they got their head hit, they've slept like a baby, and there's been no change in their sleep pattern. I really doubt they had a concussion. Sleep is, gets disrupted almost immediately after a concussion. So it could be that the people that are complaining are really complaining because they're sleep deprived and they're getting those symptoms. But you know, this, this way of trying to assess people who don't complain is a very big problem. You bring up a very good point. I was yeah. just going to say, yeah, just to jump on that real quick. Uh, We've seen both. We've seen athletes who have, uh, you know, complained of subjective symptoms that are, you know, correlated to concussion, and us test them right at the moment um, when they complain about them. Or we've seen them come in the next day or two days later and say, you know, I don't feel right. Something at that game last night might have got me, and now I've got this problem, this problem, this problem, and pr this problem. And that's one of the reasons why this. I think is so important is because it's giving us information about where the problem is coming from, right? If I ch test their eye tracking and they have normal attention, then I know that I've got to look somewhere else for the problem. And they may have uh, symptoms that are that are specific um, to concussion, but um, also be specific to other things like sleep deprivation or dehydration or you know a neck thing or whatever. So that's what I do is after I test them, I see that their eye tracking is normal. I can say, okay, this is not an attention problem. Your symptoms aren't related to this attention issue that we see with concussion. Um, now I need to look somewhere else. Is it possible to uh, No, no, I don't think I don't think that the attention and balance. I haven't seen. I mean, we don't know. Yeah, most of the people, um, yeah, so, yeah, they're not going to, they're not going to have suddenly have an attention balance problem two days afterwards. Okay. We, we see it immediately. It's the symptoms, the subjective stuff the is symptoms what we see, come what they later. report. Yeah, the symptoms come later. Okay, okay one more. Okay. Great question, great question. So the military is funding that study right now. We're doing eye tracking the sidelines at uh, actually Stanford. We're doing we're doing uh, we're having people work out and then do eye tracking before and afterwards. So far, we've done it on uh, research assistants. We haven't seen any, we're climbing up and down stairs. We haven't seen any effect, but uh, it's a good question. I think it's going to actually improve their eye tracking, but we'll see what happens. Get more focus. Uh, we're also looking at impact without concussion as well. So, all right. So we want to do the interview now. You want to do? This? Yeah. Okay.
Yeah, so we've so, got a volunteer today. So uh, we just want to go ahead and demonstrate this uh, real, and just show you how simple it is to actually run this test. Um, obviously, if you want to have the test done, you can go to the pavilion and um, there's a bunch of them there. I was there earlier this morning and there wasn't a line. So hopefully, uh, if you're interested in looking at it. But uh, Riley's a friend of mine and is a uh, high school soccer player uh, in this area. And do you mind if we talk a little bit about your history? So do you want to? Uh, yeah. So yeah, last we need a microphone, 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 or whatever. Yeah, I got one last year. I was at a training. I heard it right away. Let me walk in a straight line to see if my balance is off. My head fell, and that was about it. Okay. Maybe you should have worn one of those bands around your head. That would have helped. <laughs> uh, no, well, because your neck is still moving. So, yeah. Do you know? Do you know what the what's the what's the uh, in soccer? What's the most prevalent cause of a concussion? Is it heading the ball or is it something else? Probably the ball hitting your head when you're not paying attention. Ball hitting your head. It's actually people colliding. It's actually players colliding on the field and and getting their head whipped around or hitting the hitting the ground. So I think this notion of going up and hitting the ball. You actually when you're hitting the ball, your neck is tensing and you're getting very little rotation of the of the head. So it's. I don't, I think where you had the ball came out of the blue and hit you, and that that'll do it. Yeah. Yep. So what do they do afterwards? Do they tell you not to do anything. Yep. Yeah. He said, "Your headaches Well, your brain will explode. So <laughs> yeah. don't worry about that. I'm, be, I'm exaggerating only because, and, yeah. And I apologize for the exaggeration, but it's the only way people are going to get this thing because we we ha exercise is turning into and sleep are turning into a major therapies for concussion as long as people believe that the brain's on fire there's something going on and you shouldn't do anything it's it's not going it's going to prolong prolong the problem so that's why i'm being a little facetious about it but yeah we've really tried to pioneer this effort to get people moving and uh you know it's even still today people are getting this recommendation from their medical people is to not do anything and there's really no evidence base to support that. Um, the reverse. Right? Yeah, it's, and so from our perspective, uh, we're really trying to um, get people moving really quickly. And one of the things that we've seen is that we can get, uh, we can stimulate recovery faster. And so for me, when I do, I, so we spent the last year using this device. Um, I used it on every single concussion that we had uh, over the past year. And our prescription was the same, was that we were going to use the objective information and not rely on the, the patient's reported symptoms to guide the recovery, and that the symptoms uh, began to resolve uh, quicker when we stimulated them with with uh, exercise. And we also prescribed sleep for them, obviously not not in a formal sense, but just telling them the importance of sleep and making sure that they're getting enough sleep. And what we've seen with eye tracking is that uh, the inform the eye tracking results did not improve. We did not see attention improve with people who were uh, struggling to get sleep. And so that's one of the things I also think that is the benefit of exercise is that you're making them fatigued and they are actually being able to go to sleep rather than tossing and turning. And so there's, a, there's right. some kind of symbiotic relationship between yeah. the two that we don't fully understand yet, that, but we're really um, pushing that. We had, we had a, a neurologist call us both um, from an athlete that we had at Stanford and uh, the parents were furious because they were saying, why are you exercising my daughter? You know, she has a, a brain injury. You know, she's gonna, something's going to happen to her. And, you know, you're going to ruin her brain and she's going to have, you know, scrambled eggs or, you know, whatever. And the neurologist called us too and said, you know, the same thing. And, and I've treated her before and I, I've always prescribed 14 days in a dark room with nothing by herself for 14 straight days. Every time she's had a concussion prior to this and we had to kind of, you know, uh, talk them off the ledge a little bit and educate them about you know this new approach. And that's essentially what Dr. Gajar has been doing and what I've been doing with parents um, this entire year is really talking people off the ledge and getting them to understand that this is a, a, a new evidence-based approach. So. Yeah, somehow, you know, then we get back to, uh, and we know we have a community representative here, but um, the sleep issue around here is huge. And we're talking about brain performance. One of the major things we're getting, we're getting more and more injuries in the kids because they're not sleeping enough. And it's sort of, and I talk to these kids, both Stanford uh, students and other students, and they're getting, all, all the parents are turning to their kids now about homework. <laughs> uh, and the kids are, you know, kids need a lot of sleep. And what happens is they, they don't sleep during the week and then they try to wake, make it up on the weekends. And the older kids obviously are, are out socializing and, and, they don't, and they don't get their sleep then. So they're basically sleep deprived. 
you're sleep deprived and the eye tracker picks up attention uh, from uh, problems from sleep. There's a different signal, I'll show you, uh, sleep deprivation. So you're not paying attention when you're sleep deprived. A lot of adults too know that when you don't get a good night's sleep, car accidents go up and all sorts of things happen. So sleep, you've got to bring sleep into the equation separate from concussion. We got it, we got it. What we're trying to do is, is optimize brain performance and reduce injuries. And that's through sleep and trying to prevent concussions and then identifying the concussions and then trying to bring them back as soon as possible. So a lot of our, so we don't need baselines on this. So when we do this, this test on the sidelines, you can see the signal right away, I'll show you. Uh, but we do, what we, what we do baselines is surveillance. We're picking, we're seeing which athletes are really sleep deprived, which ones have had prior concussions, and so that's, that's what the baseline is with eye tracking. We don't need, we're not doing it to compare before and after. We can actually see when they're doing their eye tracking that they're really abnormal, and I'll, and I'll show you that in a minute. Can we just have her take the test? Yeah. yeah. So just to show how simple it is. So this is how I would normally administer the procedure is we just have the athlete um, sit at a table, just like you see in the picture up there before, um, and you're going to put your elbows on the table, and you're just going to uh, hold your face up against it. And then when we select the test, I'll just... Basically, I get a view of her eyes, um, so the cameras are into the um, into the uh, tablet here, which shows me her eyes. I see a reflection of the cameras that are built into this on her eyes that tells me that um, her eye position is in the right place. Do you have that? I'm going. <laughs> there you go. Yep, there you go. So uh, once we know that they're doing, they have their eyes nice and wide, the cameras can pick this up, then that's when we uh, administer the test. A lot of times with concussion, you got somebody who's got one eye that's half open, or you know they're they can't they have trouble fixing this on their face. Um, you know they're disoriented or they're uh, they can't pay attention, so they're not really sure w what they're doing and where they are. So once they do that, we'll start the test. She's going to stare at the red dot, and we're going to do a short calibration series of following the dot with her eyes to make sure that she, the cameras are picking up her eyes and that she's not malingering, um, or, and that the, the test will ensue after she does that. That takes about 15 seconds. And then after that, she'll see a red dot that will go in a predictable circular manner, and she will follow that with her eyes, and that will give us, that will be our test reading. It takes about 45 seconds. Um, so these are Oculus Rift goggles, what we do is we take out uh, the lenses, we put cameras behind them. So right now, if you buy VR, it doesn't have eye tracking cameras, but eventually for gaming, they're gonna put eye tracking cameras because you don't do this when you're, when you're looking around, you know, you, you actually move your eyes. So you're gonna get scene changes with eye movement and the, and the cameras will see where your eyes are looking and then change the scene accordingly. So for right now, we, we have to put the uh, eye, these are infrared emitters around here that shine on your eye and you can see them here. See these white dots here on your eyes? Those are infrared emitters, and the, and, the, and the computer can figure out where your eye position is in regard to the target, and that's what we measure for attention. And that test takes 30 seconds. So, yeah. And then the score comes up immediately, and also we can, we can look at that. So I'll show you some of that. Uh, here's all my slides. You can see everything as we go through it. So we're gonna test you afterwards. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very quickly, what's the science behind this? Here it is. So it's called the predictive brain state. Uh, I wrote about this with Rich Ivory, who's professor of uh, psychology at, uh, at UC Berkeley, who's an ex expert in the cerebellum. It's all from the cerebellum. This is the back part of your brain here. This is actually a clock eyes. put in by Martians. It's like nobody knows the anatomy of the cerebellum is very different from the rest of the brain. And some very interesting things to happen here. The cerebellum is the only organ that actually the brain cells are outside the cerebellum when you're born. And then as kids play, they start descending and making connections. So I actually gave a lecture at Bing on, uh, on development of uh, attention during play. And it turns out, you know how many brain cells are in here? There's a type of brain cell called the granule cells. There's 100 billion cells in the brain, just rounded off. 80 billion are right here, 80 billion cells. And so what's happening is the whole brain is actually feeding, see these arrows here? It's a huge feed of sensory information coming into the cerebellum. And those 80 billion cells are responsible for predicting the future two and a half seconds ahead. And so they predict it and tell the front part of the brain what to expect. And that's why you have this predictive brain state. And that's why you can interact and play tennis and do all sorts of things because of the cerebellum. If you take this out, you can't play tennis anymore. You can't play, drive a car can't interact in real time, you have real problems. You gotta slow everything down and you're, and you're jittery. 
So this is like the, the prediction circuit, and we wrote a, a paper. What happens is the front part of the brain, where the, the signal goes to predicting the future, gets damaged. And so you, you, you're out of sync. You can't predict very well. And uh, on that basis, we used eye tracking because it's a very sensitive measure. So here's, by the time he sees that ball, it's over there. He's got to swing his racket before it gets there. And this is the horizon of interaction. That's what you're doing all the time. You're always swinging your brain before the information comes in so you can process it just in time. Um, those are the networks I went through. This is the cerebellum. This thing here projects, it's called the dentate nucleus, projects to the, um, they thought just to the motor pathways to control mo movement. Half of it actually projects to, dorsal, uh, to prefrontal cortex where cognition is. The cognition, thinking, is actually a motor function. And half of this is predicting, using prediction for cognition. So you're actually predicting when you want to think. When the sensory information comes in, you want to, you want to synchronize it with motor function. So that's doing that. So if you look at reaction time, it's kind of a fun experiment. If you look at jitter, which is the main function, if you, if you don't have good prediction, you get a lot of jitter. So here's your, who's, who's six years old here? Seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten-year-old, okay, ten-year-old. Is that, is that the youngest kid? 10, 10, anyone else? Okay, here's a 10-year-old. Actually, you're doing, you're doing okay. You're getting better. Here. So, so, so here's, very, here's a five-year-old. They have a lot of wobbliness, you know? They're not, and they start playing tennis, they sort of, their hand is sometimes getting the ball, sometimes not. And then you come in here, this is the golden 20s. The 20s where, you're, where your prediction's really good. You can do lots of things. You can listen to music, you can play video games, you can have conversations, and you can maintain your prediction really well. well. And then here's me out here, we're trying to like keep it in, hang on there for dear life, but we're not doing all that well. And if you look at, um, so here's very young kids, they've got a lot of jitter in their reaction times. This is, this is looking at how well you predict, basically. Simple reaction time. And here's, here's the 20 year olds that we hire, they want medical school, law school, or whatever, they, they're really great, and here's us as we get older. Uh, so. Why use the eye as a measurement for this function? The reason is because all the information has got to land here in the fovea. It's, the, it's the, your thumb. When you look at your thumb, that's where all the information, that's what you focus on. Everything else is a blur. In fact, what Oculus Rift is trying to do now for gaming, they're doing foveated rendering. I don't know if you know about this. What they're trying to do is put all the pixelation in that thumbprint there, and everything else is fuzzy. And then when you look somewhere else, it becomes foveated again. That's what we do all the time. Well, it's really difficult to do for computing power. But anyway, so the eye is really great because you've got fovea, and when you start moving, you've got to land everything on there. So the eye's really got to predict in its movement what's about to happen. So we use eye movements because it's, it's the same as attention networks. Uh, the front part of the brain is damaged after a concussion. We can do this very quickly, 30 seconds, and we've got this portable device. What we do is a dot goes around in a circle for 30 seconds. Surprise. We measure the, the position of the eye compared to the target, and we measure the jitter around that. And so here's a, here's a video. This shows you what, what normally, let's see if I can get this. Uh, eye hand coordination things. Let's just use this as a test. Okay, so this is the, um, the right eye and the left eye following the dot. We're just displaying it. This is a normal person, and both eyes are following the dot really well. Okay, that's normal, good prediction. Because by the time you see the dots, it's, it's gone. So the brain's got to predict where it's going to be. It moves the eyes to be there. And here's somebody with a concussion. Watch what happens. See those big jumps? Jumping ahead. Jumping ahead to where the target's going to be. See that? So this is what it looks like when you, when you show it. Here's a normal person, left eye, right eye, and this, these, each one of these is a camera shot. The camera's going at 500 times a second. And here's the position of the eye versus the target. Very nice eye tracking. Here's the concussion. Look what happens. The person jumps ahead to where the target's going to be. This tells you what, what the brain is doing. The brain is actually in the future couple of seconds, and what it does is it puts brakes on it so you're in real time, and it uses that brake to allow you, so when you're playing, um, when you're playing tennis, you actually want to, you actually want to swing your racket earlier, and the way what the cerebellum does is it, 
it holds back your hand, it breaks it, so it's just at the right time when the ball gets there. So it's, or you can, another analogy is a car analogy. You want to go 60 miles an hour and have a conversation with somebody next to you. You press down the gas all the way, you go 120. You press on the brake, so you go 60, you have your conversation. The brakes are damaged, you're suddenly jumping ahead or going back or whatever, then you have problems. You can't have a conversation with the outside world. And that's what's happening. What's happening is the person's brakes don't work in the front of the brain that the cerebellum has, and you start jumping ahead into the future. So that's why people feel out of sync. So it's a unique signature that we see in concussion. Let's see. I'm going to go forward here. Somebody help me in here. I did. <laughs> there we go. It's yeah, it's stalled in in old time. So here's here's recovery. Here's somebody who's recovering quickly from this is one of our athletes. So this is on this is baseline, this is a concussion, see the Ford thing, and then two days later it's recovered. Here's somebody who takes a long time to recover, but they have a really bad signal. We get different recovery curves. Yeah. And then it's very different from sleep deprivation. Sleep, this is 100 soldiers. We, we sleep deprived here at 6 o'clock in the evening, and then we sleep deprived them overnight. There's a place in, in Boston where they torture the, 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 uh, the Army guys, and this is one of the sleep deprivation labs. And so you can see what happens. They get really fuzzy around the target, but it doesn't look like a concussion where they have these forward saccades. So we actually can see sleep deprivation in people separately from what a concussion looks like. And so I get a lot of people coming to clinics saying I had a concussion, but they look like this. They have all the symptoms, they feel fatigued, they've got headache, they can't concentrate. It's really because they're not sleeping well, not because they had a concussion. Sometimes they recover from the concussion, they end up like this. Then we did, we did uh, uh, published a lot of articles on this showing co uh, co um, a correlation with frontal uh, white matter injury and eye tracking. I won't get into that. And here's our normals. So we've done, we're about to finish a, t a study of 10,000 people. And here are the athletes at Stanford who scored the best in terms of eye tracking. The military is very close. You can see they look very similar. And then civilians are the next best in terms of, in terms of eye tracking. Uh, this, this is, uh, we're about to finish this up. The military's fund us to do 10,000 people. We've done 5,000 eye tracking at Fort Hood. Uh, we've done 3,000 athletes with baseline. We're also doing sideline assessment using these goggles at USC, UC Santa Barbara, Berkeley, uh, Oregon State, actually Utah as well, and Stanford. And we just got funded uh, by NCAA and Pac-12 to do concussion studies, not with eye tracking, but just general concussion studies so far in all Pac-12 schools. And so this is what I do in clinic. I basically focus after I do the eye tracking, the eye tracking is my main test, but I also look, we also send them for balance and vestibular. We've been talking a lot about attention. The other part is a little brain inside the ear that can get damaged totally separately. So you have to do vestibular balance. You cannot just look at attention alone. So eye tracking is great, but you also have to look at balance because it can be separately affected. Um, and we also do neuropsych testing, and I really focus on sleep and exercise. I, you know, if they have a concussion, Oh, well, it doesn't matter, even if they don't have a concussion, a lot of people don't exercise, so cardio exercise. It can't be I'm walking my dog every day. That doesn't count, okay? You gotta have your heart rate up for at least 20 minutes. So uh, this is the study in pediatrics showing that five days of rest was worse than two days of rest. So basically exercise is the key. And the large, we had a large meeting uh, last year, and basically the evidence is we're, we're about to publish evidence to show that exercise improves recovery. Um, so the main things that improve recovery are exercise, cardio, at least 20 minutes with a high heart rate at least every other day, and sleep, and it's specifically REM sleep. So it's not just how many hours you get, it's the architecture. So being in REM is, and I have my own pet theory about why you need REM sleep, but we can talk about it. But, this is very important for recovery. If people don't sleep, recovery can get very delayed. And that you saw the eye tracker, that you can go to the pavilion and, and get your tested. And actually you can buy it in, in Amazon now. This is, this is the next um, version we're going to, which is the Gear VR. 
you have a Samsung phone in the front, put eye trackers in it, and you're off and running. It, it doesn't cost $99 because once you put, you have to go to, send them to Germany, put the eye trackers in, that's where the cost goes through the roof. <laughs> huh? Two slides back. One, two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Change in attention. Yep. You know what? If you tell a person that they have cancer, they're going to die tomorrow, they usually do. So, uh, so it, it, what you tell a patient is incredibly important for their recovery. So I tell people it, that it's not a brain injury because we don't have, we don't have a demonstration for it. CT and MRI are normal. 90% of the time, CT and MRI are normal. So where is the evidence that there's a brain injury? Somebody has migraines can be a lot more effective than, than a concussion, yet you don't tell a person with a migraine they have a brain injury, right? So, and 90% and so, and and, uh, plus of people recover. So if you tell those 90% they have a brain injury, brain injury, when you say brain injury, it sounds like a stroke. So it's something that you're not going to recover from. It, it really, I think, and a lot of other physicians have found that it really delays recovery. I want them to focus on cardio exercise, on their sleep, and, and also be very optimistic that they're going to make a complete recovery. You know, at the end of the day, I'd say, you know, I'm counting like five patients out of like two or 300 that really have not improved. And I'm, I'm wondering what something before, you know, they, they had some pre-existing condition or something like that. So I think it's very important to educate people, unless you have an MRI that shows microhemorrhages or something like that, you know, if you don't have that evidence, then you shouldn't be telling people they have a brain injury. And we also have cases of athletes where their, their uh, eye tracking does not improve over time uh, for ser from serial testing for months. And uh, those are the athletes that we say you shouldn't be playing contact sports. And we actually retire them. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Oh. Where's the... Okay, well, I should have before. So the, what we do is we look at the eye position versus the target, and we see how many degrees difference there are, and then we add them all up over 30 seconds, and we get an average distance, and we get a thing called the standard error of the mean. You know what that means? It's like a variance metric. It's like, so if you, if you took everyone's, if everyone in the room was five or six years old, the average would be 5.5, 5, 5 you know, and there'd be very little... Uh, variation in the ages. That's, that's the thing we look at. Look at the jitter, the variation, and that's the score that we give. Is we find that people have really good attention, have very little variance. They're, very, they're right on. They can predict all the time consistently. Yeah. yeah. Over there. Right on. Go ahead. Does the nutrition and hydration Yours. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, for preventing a concussion. We don't really know anything uh, as of right now that can prevent a concussion. You know, that, that we can just say, oh, take this and you won't get a concussion. Um, I, I do think it helps in recovery uh, along with sleep. Um, hydration is obviously a key element, especially for those that are um, going through a, uh, an exercise-based recovery protocol. We want to make sure that they're hydrating and, and properly um, fueling themselves so that they can uh, manage their bodies through the recovery process as well. Absolutely. And, and we, we have done that. We work with a nutritionist who will prescribe uh, a certain type of diet for our athletes, you know, whether it be anti-inflammatory based diet or um, uh, setting up their meal schedule so that they can fall asleep easier at night, things like that to help facilitate recovery. Let me have three weeks ago, very concerned about the prescribed. Melatonin? Like melatonin? Yeah. Melatonin? Oh, yeah, yeah. Can't give uh, medical advice out if I haven't seen the patient. But I, 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 my philosophy is, is to, to not have any medications and to try to, uh, cardio usually, usually poops them out. And that, <laughs> I find that a lot of people who don't exercise start taking naps during the day. And when they take long naps during the day, it takes away their sleep drive at night and then they don't go to sleep properly. So the thing is not to take naps, get a lot of cardio. It's not walking your dog. It's getting your heart rate up, you know, high. And there's there's charts on the on the treadmills and and bikes that tell you what where you should be. And then that um, causes them to be sleeping, go to sleep, and have a good night's sleep. So I'd rather stay away from the medications. I don't. 
There are, there are very few medications for sleep that actually don't disrupt architecture. A lot of them disrupt architecture and you end up not getting enough REM sleep. You get like your eight hour, I mean, if you take Ambien or whatever, you'll notice you'll, you'll feel a little groggy. You won't be as sharp as you are. But then some people have real problems. You know, there's other things, people have sleep apnea and all that kind of stuff. You really, I spend, actually I think I spend a, gr a big deal of time, I find that people um, in general, even before they have a concussion, have real sleep issues. You know, they're, they're waking up a lot, they're not, and they wake up in the morning, they're sleep deprived, and so, and just generally sleep you know, hygiene is a big deal. I think people are focusing on diet a lot, but uh, sleep hygiene is really important to get to pay attention in the day. And, and just real quick, uh, with regards to melatonin, we have healthy athletes that take that, uh, you know, just to improve their sleep, you know, and it, they have no injury history. Um, what I've found is that everybody has a different response to this type of thing. You know, um, these are over-the-counter supplements usually uh, with melatonin in them. And some people, you know, say that they help and some people don't. There's they a have whole no, timing no issue with melatonin about your sleep cycle. You've got to take it just the right time. So it's important. All right. I think we've got one, more, one more question. One more. Um, actually, just, you know, I Yeah, we sent, we sent a lot of people to sleep medicine. They have a very good sleep medicine at Stanford, and they, they, they do a lot of training, so that's really good, too. Okay, I think we're... Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we'd like to do... The experiment we did was, was just from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. for the soldiers. Uh, we want to do, because in the Marines and all that, those guys go 36 hours, have naps. We want to know how long of a nap they need to get their eye tracking back to normal. We haven't done that yet. So that's a future experiment. All right, well, thank you very much all for coming. And if you want to have your eye tracking, go outside of the booth. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.